Fossil fuels are changing our planet and devastating every single aspect of our lives. But how can we begin to grasp something of this immense scale? Well, in today's video, I wanted to do something a little bit differently. And I met with one of my all time climate heroes to talk about how we can get our heads around what climate change is doing to our planet. I'm Adam, a climate scientist with a PhD from Oxford, sharing what you need to know about climate change. And joining me to share things about climate change today is climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe. Hi, Catherine. Yes. Hi, Adam. So I'm an atmospheric scientist with a PhD from the University of Illinois. And Catherine is also very good at sharing things about climate change. Maybe one of the most famous sharing things about climate change people in the world. Along with you. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll just take that and we'll move on. <laughs> and so one of the things I thought would be really lovely to do while Catherine happens to be here is talk about some of the ways we get around the complexity of climate change. And I think bo we both over the years have come up with various analogies and comparisons to help people understand what climate change is. We can understand the science at a really complex level, but if we can't communicate it in ways that make sense to people, then what use is it? Let's start at the beginning of, of climate change. The greenhouse effect, I guess everyone's heard of it and maybe has some idea of it, but I think you've got a really nice way of making it feel more vi visual and tangible than we normally think about it. Ready? Yes. <laughs> so our planet has a natural blanket of heat trapping gases that keeps us at just the right temperature for life. But since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have been digging up more and more coal and gas and oil and burning it, producing extra heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. And just like you would if someone snuck into your room at night and put an extra blanket on you, you wake up sweating saying, hey, I didn't need this blanket. In the same way, our Earth is heating up because of the extra blanket of carbon pollution that we have been wrapping around it. And what I often find about this is, even though we know this is the problem, we're still putting on more and more blankets as time goes on. And then we're going to the doctor and saying, oh, I think I've got flu. And that actually reminds me of another analogy I use, okay. which is that people say, well, it's just a few degrees. Why does it matter? Why it matters is because over the course of human civilization on this planet, and I want to emphasize this is about us. It's not about saving the planet. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. Yeah, this it's is about not going to explode us. anytime soon. No, no. <laughs> but the question is what's going to happen to us? And so over our civilization, which isn't that long, the Earth's average temperature has been as stable as that of the human body. But today the Earth's temperature has already increased by well over a full degree Celsius and it's pushing one and a half degrees Celsius. And if your body temperature went up that much, you'd be feeling achy, you'd be taking some medicine, you'd be calling the doctor, you'd be running a fever. That's the same thing that's happening to our planet. And, and that's exactly what we're already seeing today. We're seeing that both the human systems and the natural systems around us are struggling to keep up with the size and the rate of the change that, that we are causing on this planet. Exactly. All right, your turn. Okay. Give me one of your analogies. Well, I have an analogy which I've actually not made a video about before because it's a bit too graphic. <laughs> and so I try to... <laughs> Save it for me. Yeah, I just thought once I've got company, that's the perfect time to talk about it. I'm sure you've heard people say, oh, why should people do anything about climate change in, in Germany or in the UK or in America? Mm. Because China is emitting so much more than us. All the time. I think there are a few answers to it. One is to think about how much every individual in these countries emits. Another is to think about the fact that it's historical emissions, emissions over all time. But another point is that every bit of warming and so every bit of emissions hurts the planet. And so the analogy I thought of was you know, if there's a group of people beating someone up. Oh! Yeah, you can see why I've not made a video about it. <laughs> if there were a yes. group of people beating someone up, uh -huh. and one of the people said, oh, well, I'm just kicking this person in the shins, but this other person's kicking the person in the stomach. Uh -huh. It's like, well, that doesn't mean you get, you get up, you're still hurting this poor person. Oh, uh, you can see why I've not made a video about that one. <laughs> yes. Do you have any more in the tank? Oh, speaking of the tank, tell me about the swimming pool. Well, so I grew up, I'm from Toronto, and I grew up with this above-ground swimming pool in the backyard. This Dinner. is not something we had in London, <laughs> yeah. but I can picture it. The level of water in the swimming pool was mm. just high enough that my toes could just touch the ground. Mm. Well, imagine that the swimming pool is the atmosphere. And before the Industrial Revolution, we had just the right amount of water in the swimming pool so our toes could touch the ground. But then at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we stuck a giant hose in the swimming pool. 
and we've been turning the hose up every year. So what's happening is that the level of water is going up, but it's also going up faster and faster. Yeah, exactly. we, we need to turn the tap off as much as possible, as, soon as, as quickly as possible. As possible. Yeah. Yes, but because it's an above ground swimming pool, it has a drain and the drain is nature. So we need to make the drain as big as possible, as much as possible too, because the drain could take up to a third of our carbon emissions out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But then there's one more thing we have to do. The water is so high now, our toes don't touch the ground. Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to swim. That's adaptation and resilience. So there's no one solution that will fix it all, but if we turn off the hose, make the drain bigger, and learn how to swim as much as we can all together, that's the way to a better future. I think this also gives a good clue for what we often get wrong when we think about net zero. So mm -hmm. often companies and countries talk about reaching net zero emissions, which is absolutely what we need to do. But they'll mm -hmm. talk about it as if the way to do that is we keep doing whatever we want with the hose, but we can just somehow magic up a pump that will suck the water back out. Right. So we know there's no way to take up all the water that's coming out of the hose. We have to turn it off. This is just a quick note to say that if you're enjoying this conversation with me and Catherine, we actually recorded a whole second video for my channel all about how we deal with the complex emotions of working on climate change. That's coming soon, so subscribe so you don't miss it. And while you're clicking on things, you might want to give me a like and a comment as well. Okay, now back to my conversation with Catherine. Well, here's an analogy that I think we get a lot, which is that carbon dioxide is only a very small part of the atmosphere, which is absolutely true. It is only a very small part of the atmosphere, but what doesn't follow from that is that means it's only a very small effect coming from carbon dioxide. So if someone gave you a glass of orange juice and just said, only a very small part of this glass of orange juice is arsenic, I would still really recommend you don't drink that glass of orange juice. So similarly, tiny amounts of something in the wrong way can uh, can have very big effects. And I would even extend that by saying, well, people say, but, but carbon dioxide is natural, it's good, it's a building block of life, and it is. But we even know that things that are good and healthy are not good and healthy for us in great quantities. It's not carbon dioxide itself that's the problem, it's the fact that we have added to it so much it's higher in the atmosphere now than it's been for millions of years. I think I can think of one more. Okay, yeah, please. Um, and one more is people often say, well, how do we come up with these limits that we set? Where do we come up with one and a half degrees or two degrees? And then they think that those are magic thresholds that if we end up at 1.4999 degrees, everything's fine. Mm. But if we end up at 1.50001 degrees, then it's all over. But the analogy is similar to smoking cigarettes. Mm. So we know there's no magic number of cigarettes you can smoke. You know, imagine if you could smoke 9,999 cigarettes and it's fine. But if you smoke number 10,000, you have lung it. cancer yeah, overnight. Yeah, yeah. That's not the way it is. In the same way, we know that the more carbon we produce, the worse it is. So why do we have these thresholds, these deadlines? It's because that's the way our human brain works. But what the science says is every bit of warming matters. Every action matters. We know every cigarette that we smoke increases our risks. And then people say, well, isn't it too late? We've already been smoking for years and even decades. We already have impaired lung capacity. We're not not going to win the Olympics anymore, <laughs> but we don't have emphysema, we don't have lung cancer, and we're not dead. Mm. So when's the best time to act as soon as possible? How much? As much as possible. For sure, yeah. If you go to your doctor and say, oh, well, I've already smoked for 20 years, I might as well smoke for the next 20 years. Yeah, they'd say you're not dead yet. So there's still the benefit of not smoking that you can have for the rest of your life. Yeah, I think that's a really nice analogy mm -hmm. and um, much nicer to act out than my punching in the face analogy, which I normally use. I think a lot of people, despite knowing that climate change is a really serious mm -hmm. issue, just have so much to care about already. What do you say to people who are in that kind of situation where they just feel m maybe climate change is a bit too abstract to, mm -hmm. to care about with all these seemingly more immediate threats around them? The thing is, often we think of climate change as one more bucket that we need to fill. So here's all the other buckets I'm already trying to fill, things that I care about, that I'm passionate about, issues, causes, concerns I have, I'm spending time on them, I'm spending money on them and I just don't have anything left for another bucket. But climate change is not a separate bucket. Mm. Climate change is the whole in every other bucket. Mm. If you're working hard to have a safe place for your family to live, climate change is the hole in that bucket threatening your ability to provide that for your family. If you care about issues like poverty or justice or inequality, climate change is the hole in the bucket exacerbating poverty, injustice and inequality. Um, if you care about even simple things like climate change is affecting our sports, 
It's affecting our beer and wine. It's affecting people's ability to spend time at the beach. <laughs> it's not just affecting the things, the worries, concerns, challenges we have. It's also affecting the enjoyment that we have in life. And if we don't fix climate change, we can't fix anything else. I think this is such a fundamental problem with how we too often talk about climate change. Mm -hmm. We too often talk about it as if it's this separate bucket, as opposed to what it actually is, which is these holes in all the buckets. And so if you've got this bucket you care about, you already care about climate change because climate change is affecting is affecting that bucket. Exactly. Um, and I think that's such a, a lovely point to almost end on. But before we do, I saw that you brought with you a really beautiful scarf. I did. So this is my warming stripe scarf. It has one row for every year. So we start off in the 1850s, and most years back in the 1850s were cooler than average. So they're blue. Then we get through to the mid 1950s and we start to see light blue and even some white years and then we start to head into the 80s the 90s the 2000s and the 2010s and almost every single year is so far above average and especially this year that we're living through today i think i'm going to have to add an extra row <laughs> it's so gorgeous and i think it's worth remembering despite how extreme the transition is mm -hmm. from the dark blue to the to the dark red this is only taking us up to the present day. What the rest of the scarf looks like, that exactly. depends on what we do next. <laughs> so our choices are gonna determine what colors go on the end of the scarf. I think many of you have probably already heard of Catherine, but it's possible that you've not heard that Catherine has her own YouTube channel. Can you explain what global weirding is all about? So wherever we live, things are not the same as they used to be. They're getting weirder. So I feel like global weirding is the perfect way <laughs> to talk about this problem that we're in and what the solutions look like. And the channel is so broad discussing the solutions, the problem with lovely analogies like we, we've spoken about today. So definitely check it out. I'll put a link uh, somewhere here, maybe on top of Catherine's face. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, bye. I feel like that's already quite a few nice analogies. Do you have any more that you yeah. really want to show? You've got my house, <laughs> oh. sorry. <laughs>